have to be very fanatical about what we believe, but and not without apology. I'm not going to apologize because I'm a soldier of Jesus Christ. And so I, I heard earlier that, that I think you used the word zeal somewhere in your <laughs> statement. We, that's what we need. We need the zeal of a zealot. Remember Jesus. Jesus was a zealot. He, he had zeal. He had passion. He had fire. He didn't come in order to maintain the status quo. When you look at Jesus very carefully, wherever Jesus was, somebody had to make a decision. Wherever he stood, somebody had to make a call. <clears throat> Listen to what he says. If any man come unto me, let him first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me daily. Listen to what he says. If any man come unto me, let him first and hate not his mother, his sister, his brother, yea, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. That's the language of Jesus Christ. He was a zealot. He was, he was zealous about everything that he did. We cannot be ashamed of that. We need to zeal us up. We need the will of a warrior. When that woman stood up in my church, do you have any idea uh, how I, my, I'm glad I had on a roll because I was shaking? <laughs> but honestly, true, when that woman stood up in my church and said, if you don't quit preaching this, I, I thank God I had on a roll. I thank God I was behind the pulpit because my hands were shaking. My, were quivering. I'm saying, oh my God, I did not expect that. Oh no, I didn't expect that. I am the Reverend Dr. Herb Lust, former Philadelphia Eagle football player, <laughs> all American. The devil don't care who you are. Right? He's gonna come at you, and when he comes at you. Best advice I can give you is advice my father gave me. Stand. Stand. Hey guys, it's a parenthetic thought, but let me share this with you. I just left California. I was in California last week. My father celebrated his 50th year as a pastor in the same church. Wow. Wow. Isn't that something? Yeah. And my father has been in his church, pastor's church, preaching the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ without compromise for 50 years. And God has kept it. Same church. Didn't get run from one to the other. Stood firm for 50 years preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's still standing 84 years old. Now, what, what does that say to us guys about this business of life? My father preaches the same gospel I preach. If God can keep him, God can keep us. Yeah. I encourage you with all of my heart to know more about what your hopes do. Get involved. Don't, don't be a fan. Don't, don't sit on the sideline with a hat and your favorite jersey on with a beer in one hand and popcorn in the other. <coughs> Get involved in this business. I want to, because of pastors here, I told you I didn't want to preach and I'm, I'm, I'm resisting that, that urge to do that. And so what I'm going to do right now is I want to ask you to ask me any question you want about why I'm in this fight. What motivates me to do it? Why did I risk my ministry? Um, why do I think it's important? Whatever questions you want to ask me, I'm open to, to answer them if I can. <clears throat> yes, sir. Dr. Lush, one of the things that strikes me about what you're saying is there seems to be more <clears throat> resistance uh, in within the African American community preaching life, certainly the one I've been in my, in my church. What can we do in a non-patronizing way, in ways encouraging to encourage, come alongside African American pastors in our Well, I think, uh, again, when, you, when the numbers are as overwhelming as they are, you're gonna get that pushback. But I think there's a healing piece that has to take place in this. One of the things that I did not know, and I'm glad you asked the question, when I started with this thing, I didn't understand how wounded my congregation was. And so the first thing that had to take place was the healing piece. 
those papers have to be named. Those papers have to have funerals. Those papers have to be buried officially, done, and so that people can move on. And so there needs to be some kind of a some kind of a way that we can communicate to people that it's okay, and to give them an opportunity to express. Because I mean, these things are buried beneath the surface, and they don't go away. And every time they hear anybody <coughs> people about life, like the first thing that the devil does is give them every reason why you all not talk about. It. But if we can approach it from a healing standpoint. I think it's going to make a big, big difference. I, what we're planning now and every year from now on to have a, a, a service for any mother or any man who ever uh, participated or encouraged a woman to have an abortion. We're going to have a service. We're going to name those children. And we're going to bury them in the name of Jesus Christ. And we're going to say, okay, you are forgiven, you're healed. Let's go forward. That's how I think we'll add more of the soldiers to this fight. And instead of having them fight against us because they're covering something that needs to be uncovered. I just want to say, last night, <clears throat> a door called um, uh, provided a memorial service, just as uh, Reverend Musk was talking about. And these women were um, placing roses in the basket as they needed their children, <clears throat> and as they buried them, and as they realized they were truly forgiven and set free. And it was a beautiful service. Um, we provide abortion recovery, Bible studies, and assistance, either one-on-one -on -one or small groups. And we would love to expand that ministry. So if we could help you and your church family uh, by either you're referring a specific woman or family to us, we'd be happy to help you out in that way. It's a safe place for her to, uh, to really uh, discover the, the healing Holy Spirit, her situation. Any other questions? Pastor, I, I, I didn't want to hear from you. I, I know you've got some stuff you're thinking. I mean, one of the things that people say to me all the time, particularly in the African American community, brothers, is, man, you're so busy about trying to save the people who are unborn. What about the people that are here already? And the question that I give back to you is it either or? Or is it not both? He said, I think you have to do both. I don't, I don't think you exclude one in order to do the other. I think that our ministries have to be very holistic in the approach. And if you go on my website, and God, God I gotta tell you, I'm, it, I, whenever I'm behind the microphone, I'm always, always difficult for me not to preach. And so what I do will tell you that if you want me to come to your church, I'll come and preach there for you. <laughs> But, but if you go on my website, and you, you'll begin to see what my church does, and you will find out that, that we have created a, a holistic ministry that deals with every aspect of the people in our community. They come to our community, they don't have a GED. Well, we, we can give them that. We can make sure they get the GED. The lady right now, who, who, who was communicating with my office in order to get me here? Well, the lady that you were communicating with Seven years ago, came to our church. She had three children, no husband, never had a job before, on welfare, didn't have a GED. That's who you were communicating with. Her life has been transformed. She has a husband. The husband adopted the children. She's finished her associate's degree. She's finished her bachelor's in business administrations. And she's a shining example of what God can do. And by the way, she was pregnant with one of the children when she came and considered abortion. But because there was a church there that saw her need and was able to meet that need, it made all the difference in the world. She, went, she came up through the ranks from our welfare to work program to our GED program to our, our college how about night college while she was working with it? And she's one of the many, not, she's not just one in a few. She's one of the many that have been touched by a holistic ministry. So I believe that you do both. And, and, and when God said it to me, I said, well, you gotta do, let me see what you do it, and then you measure what I'm doing, and we'll see whether I'm concerned about people who are already alive. We're concerned about the whole man, yeah. the whole man.
And I think the, the life movement, well, I said this to my Caucasian friends and brothers, that, that we have to be holistic in the approach. Because the argument is always, what about justice, right? What about what you're doing for people who, who are, you, you, we, get, we have to have as much compassion for those that are here struggling as we do for those who are trying to struggle to get here. And we have to be able to stand and prove that's how we are and how we feel. Question, Tess. Yes, sir. So uh, my guess is that uh, when a lady like that comes to your church, you wouldn't have somebody available to individually work with them and sort of take them by the hand. Uh, our churches do not connect directly or don't have on the premises or real close a uh, crisis pregnancy center, but I'm asking a question that's sort of going into uh, suggesting what we need to do. Okay. And that is that we need to have people ready and willing and available to take these folks by the hand to the door of hope and to be ready to support them. As you're saying, it's not just go to the door of hope. Hope things work out well for you. We've got to be there to be with them. No question about it. And by the way, uh, I talked about the people who have left my church because of this movement. Yes, my church has grown faster than it has since I started this school. My church has grown faster than ever before. We had to go to three services. We had two services filled. We didn't have. We either had to build or go to a third service. And so, ultimately, the gospel always wins out. Jesus says, "If I can live to it, I'll draw all men unto myself." Yeah, you have to, again, even if you don't have a crisis purpose to yourself and you're taking them to hope. Yeah, you want to be a part of that. And, and hope can show you how to do that. They, they will show you how to stay in that person's life because that person needs a church. Hope is not a church. Right. Hope is not a church. I mean, I, I have to tell all these parents over the this, this over and over again. You are not a church. And you're not, and so what you what you are part of something that will accentuate that to help and to cultivate. But you are not a church. You have to stay connected to the church. And what I like about the whole is they understand that. They understand it so much that they beg you to come because they know they can't do it without you. And when they told me to come, and typically I have a fee for coming. I didn't even talk about a fee because I knew passion. As a matter of fact, don't give me anything now. I hope my mouth out there. If he won't give me some, keep it. I don't want it. <laughs> but this is important. What, what we're doing right now, the discussion, the, the things that are, you're thinking about right now are critical. And that's the reason why I want to hear what you're saying. I want to hear what you're thinking. I want to answer some of your questions. Some of them I may not be able to answer. I don't know everything. I just know a little bit. I'm just an old country preacher from Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> Y'all know that's where I'm from? You hear that, y'all, and it's okay. <laughs> That's where I'm from. I was listening. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. I don't know about the, the country boy. Uh, uh, I have my poverty credentials. I shine shoes. I pick cotton. I chop sewing beans. I was in Memphis, Tennessee when Martin Luther King got assassinated. I was there. I, I remember going to the colored bathroom. I remember going to the colored water fountain. I remember going to the back door of the store in order to buy something for my mother. I've been, you know, I've been around. I've been around. I'm going to you, man. And you know what? I've got my shoes shined a few times. And I got to tell you, I think I can make a good living shining shoes right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I want to say, man, when you get, get back, get up here and let me show you how to shine. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I had to get that.